Our reading this morning, Luke chapter 18, going to read from verse 18 up to 30. Story of the rich young ruler. Let us pray. Lord, we can also say that you are our heart's desire. You are more precious than silver or gold. And thank you that you are indeed the one that can satisfy. And as we are gathered here this morning, Lord, we pray to give us a teachable heart. Give us ears to listen and speak to us. And every heart you have prepared, Lord, may they receive the seed of your word and may it bring forth fruit to your glory. Amen. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have a treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, because he was a man of great wealth. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with men is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. I tell you the truth. Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. So far the reading of the word. Now we see in this passage the references to eternal life. And that reveals to us the theme of this story. Now all Christians are benefited and will benefit by learning from this story from the Lord Jesus himself how to properly respond to those who show interest in their eternal destiny. So many people in the church as well and the church as a whole have their own view how to approach and how to respond to people who request and ask questions about salvation. Now the heart of the lesson is that people must be led to understand that the cost, that there is a cost required to receive eternal life. Obviously, no one was more concerned about the danger of superficiality than the Lord Jesus was. He consistently made it clear the difficulty of seeking to enter the kingdom of God, what they faced. And the meeting with this wealthy, influential young man is a classic story and account of him addressing the very issue of the cost of true discipleship. The matter here focused on repentance and submission to the Lord. The Lord did not only accept his superficial interest in him apart from 
his heart attitude of penitence and submission. It was not for the Lord only his outward request to be part of eternal life. Jesus was interested in the state of his heart. And because salvation comes to those not only who have, a right, who have a right understanding of Jesus, but also correctly understand the condition of their own sinful and proud hearts and seek forgiveness, while at the same time offering a willingness for obedience. So the central meaning of this story is clear. You cannot just believe things in general about the Christian faith. And no one enters the kingdom without humbly confessing his or her sinfulness and by faith is willing to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Salvation is more about believing the facts concerning the gospel. It also involves that people believe and what they believe concerning their own sinful nature and the authority of Christ. So genuine salvation requires uh, an acknowledging and a willingness to let go of anything the Lord demands. Jesus gave this man the choice between himself and Christ. And without a proper assessment of his heart and the willingness to forsake his pride and his religious achievements and abandon his worldly God and ambitions, he could not be saved. So the test the Lord gave him revealed that he loved himself and his possessions more than Christ. The choice he made was very surprising. Because at the first glance, this young man appeared to be the perfect seeker. Now, according to the, today's evangelistic methods, Jesus should have found the right language, should have been softly spoken to this man and used acceptable terms to move him to the offer of salvation. You know, that is the way we wishy-washy, way we, the church used today, just to accept people. Don't say anything that will offend them. Just try to get them into the church by any way and any means. But Jesus did not do that. And this story is placed in the context here in chapters 17 and 18 of the discussion of Christ about the kingdom of God. And this illustrates to us what it means to be part of this kingdom. Now we see in verse 18 a certain ruler approach Jesus and ask him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We see, therefore, he was a wonderful prospect. Wonderful. Interested in more than even the church. Interested in eternal life. And like the Pharisee we have seen last Sunday in Luke 18, he recognized his need. You know, the Pharisee, and the tax collector we have seen last Sunday, the Pharisee was unaware of his need. We see here this man recognize he had a need. What, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Despite all his religious achievements, and it must have been enough to make him a ruler, a ruler in a synagogue, he must have been morally of very high standard. Must have been an impressive man. But he was seeking all these things 
by his own effort and his own morality. But there was still an emptiness. And he wanted a relief from this burden of legalism. He wanted to be more, have more assurance of the presence of God, of hope, of peace. So he was seeking eternal life. And the Bible tells us eternal life. And the Jew, Jews believed that as well. It's not what we receive at the end of our life when we die. No, eternal life is a life that begins now. It's the life of God. It comes through the knowledge of Christ. John 17 verse 3. In the second place we see he, he not only understood his lack, the need in his life, but also urgently and eagerly and diligently sought to gain what he did not possess. So in spite of his reputation, and we see in the other Gospels who record the same story, he ran up to Jesus and knelt before him in full view of everyone. And that is a great thing to do. People in high standing in society don't easily humble themselves. There's too much pride. And he asked a very honest question and, and wanted a solution for the spiritual emptiness in his heart. And we see also in the third place, he came to the right person. Many seek spiritual life and help in the wrong places. They go to the wrong church. Some people are only interested if they are happy, go lucky, and they feel comfortable. They don't worry what people are preaching or teaching or if there is truth. So many go to a wrong church. They go to a wrong religion. They go to a wrong teacher. But this man not. He came to the only source of life, the Lord Jesus. So we must recommend him for that. And he specifically addressed Jesus as good. Good teacher. Therefore elevating himself of Christ above the other teachers and almost associating him with God. And asking maybe the right question as well. What shall I do to inherit and take possession of eternal life? Maybe he was still thinking in keeping with his legalistic system he was living in, his self-righteousness. What other deed must I do and add to my life? And Jesus knew that he had a fatal flaw in his life. And that would reveal his desire in the very end to be false and to be deceptive. In the first instance, Jesus replied, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. Maybe challenging this man to, to just confirm that he not only know God is truly good, but he is also connecting Jesus with God. That he's from God. So Jesus answered this man, you know the commandments. You know the commandments. And he answering this man in the framework of his own way of thinking. And Jesus recited some of the commandments, five of the second table of the commands, ten commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. Maybe leaving out the tenth commandment. And this man responded, All these things I have kept from my youth. And that reveals the self-deception he was living under. That he is telling Jesus, and that is the attitude of so many people, that this young man is telling Jesus, I lack nothing. I am okay. I have kept the commandments. What a common attitude of so many people. 
This man knew everything. He knew how to work for God and serve God. He, he know, knows the Ten Commandments. I am okay. It's not me. There's no problem with me. On the surface, if you look at my life, everything seems to be okay. The Bible tells us there will be many people in Judgment Day that will stand before Christ and even tell the Lord, Lord, I have worked for you. I drove out demons. I have preached in your name. And Christ will answer them, I never knew you. Some people are so proud of their own good. They need to be ashamed. This man, I've kept it all. I'm okay. I'm the best. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a level above other people. I can give other people advice, you know, what to do and how to live. I'm morally above. Sometimes people are so proud. So full of themselves, their own good, instead of being ashamed. Paul were like that before his conversion. Philippians 3 verse 6. In the eyes of the religious Jews, he said, I, I could say concerning righteousness which is of the law, I was blameless. You know, that's the attitude of many people, even in the church. It's not me. I am okay. And therefore Jesus proceeded to the next point. This man, unwilling to be aware of his own sinfulness, Jesus said to him, you still lack one thing. You showed one thing. And Jesus revealed by that his misunderstanding of the law. He needed to confess his sin. He didn't understand the law. James 2 verse 10 tells us, whoever keeps the whole law and just stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. This man looked at the law. He was in religion only to elevate himself. How good I am. And Jesus needed to open his eyes. So that he would be willing to confess his sin, his inability to satisfy God's law. And therefore Jesus tells him, you lack one thing. He certainly had not loved the Lord with all his heart, soul and mind. He had failed to see that the law only makes people sinners and unable, is unable to save us. The law cannot save but it reveals to us how sinful we are and this man studied the law he knew what the law was all about but he was never convicted by the law of his own sinfulness the church is not there to preach morality a good life because morality cannot save. Oh, how many times people in the church, that's the place for good people. Just learn a few good things and teach children also a few good things and later on we will tell them about the gospel. No. The law is there to tell us about the depth of our sins. Morality cannot save. Christ alone can save. And the law reveals to us our sinfulness so that we can flee to Him who can redeem us from the guilt and the power of the law. But this man, he, was, he believed that he was more righteous than he really was. You know, and that is what sin does. It blinds you for your sinfulness. 
The law was given to show us the impossibility to live according to God's standards. And he was not willing to admit what he did have and needed to get rid of and that he sinned. That he sinned. So in his life, he fell short of God's holiness. And he was an offense to him. But he cried out, I lack nothing. I'm okay. He had no hatred for sin. He had no, in his heart, felt a need for forgiveness or acceptance before God. But salvation is for those people who despair of their own effort. And Jesus' words to him, One thing you lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. Reveals as well the divine requirement that God asked from us as well. Jesus was filled with love and compassion to this man. We read in the other story in Matthew as well, when he saw this young man, he loved him. He loved him. But Jesus saw that this man was empty. He climbed to the top of the ladder of success only to find that the ladder was against the wrong building. And Jesus pointed out to this man the first table of the law. The laws that have to do with our relationship with God. Jesus is challenging this man to put God first. Where was his heart? He was worshipping money and materialism. That was his God. But Jesus was telling him, the first few commandments ask us to serve God supremely. Salvation does not come because we are decent people. Because we are good to our fellow man. There are a lot of good people. They are all over the world decent people. Salvation does also not come through generosity. But it comes through humble denying yourself and in obedient faith come to God for salvation. Christ does not ask of all of us to sell everything and give everything away. We don't read that in the Bible. It's not for all who want to follow Christ. And in this man's situation, that was his problem. It was his God, his money. Many Christians like this man or many people are unable to be Christians because of their own egos and themselves. And Jesus challenges this man man, to admit that his money was more valuable to him. And because of that to get rid of it and put his life under the authority of God himself. But this young man was not willing to give Christ his sins to be forgiven. And he was not willing to give his life to God to be ruled by him. He wanted to be in control himself. And we read about this man. He went away grieved. He owned a lot of of property. He was bounded by materialism, bounded by his God whom he served, and he was unwilling to let go. Although every sin must be forsaken for Christ's sake, there is sometimes a certain group of sins that a person finds particularly difficult to give up. And that was in this man's case. And he went away grieving 
And it's interesting, Jesus did not call him back. You know, at this stage, if a minister would do the same as Jesus did, the people would say, what are you doing? You are chasing that man away. He's a good prospect. He could give a good offering to the church. Jesus did not call him back. He set his standards of discipleship. And he never wavered. He never changed it. And what was his commentary on this episode? He's almost describing the poverty of riches. After um, Jesus looked at the young ruler walking away, he turned to his disciples, he said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. They must have been shocked because they believed riches was a blessing from God. And this man, and Jesus continues, For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. There's a great danger in riches. It gives people such a soft way of living materialism. As Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, it can be a danger to your faith. But it's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to be rich. The Bible says and there's many examples of, of rich people. But when it becomes your God, when it becomes your trust, it's a big obstacle. And after the words of Christ, the disciples exclaimed, Who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. And he repeats the wonderful truth that salvation is humanly impossible. It's only a sovereign act of God that can change the heart of a person. It's God's work. True salvation is a deep work of the Holy Spirit that brings conviction of sin. And this man did not have this conviction. It's only the Holy Spirit that can bring it. You cannot try to create it in a superficial way. Today even in Lent, sometimes people try to create times of penance and sorrow over sin, try to organize it. You cannot organize penance. You cannot organize repentance. It's a work from God. It's a work and a convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Some people want artificially in this time of Lent even, say, I, I fast certain things and I stop eating chocolates. What the Bible tells you to do is stop sin. That's what we need to do. Fast self-righteousness, fast your pride, fast your anger, fast your materialism. Stop sinning. That's the fasting that God likes in Isaiah 58 tells us. That's the fasting that God likes is stop sinning. In contrast to the rich ruler, the disciples said they have abandoned everything to follow Christ. They made the great exchange and that's what the gospel is about. Is about. But whenever a someone saw their own need or see their own need, feel their own emptiness, striving to receive from God real life, they become aware of their own poverty, of their own sinfulness. And they are convicted by the Holy Spirit of their needs and they seek the treasure 
as Matthew 13 tells us. The treasure that they find is so precious. They are prepared to sell everything to obtain the treasure, the treasure in the field. The gospel is so precious, so valuable, that when you find this pearl, this costly pearl, you are prepared to sell everything to obtain it. And the young ruler's problem was his wealth he trusted in. It was not his wealth that was the problem, but he trusted in his wealth and in his own ability to meet God's standards. To be a Christian, you must be willing to completely entrust all that you are and all that you have to all that God is and wants to give to you. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for the example of this young ruler and that you are also calling us to follow you according to your ways. Lord, there are many who connect themselves to the Christian faith, calling themselves disciples, but not according to your rule. Oh Lord, give us grace to understand what it means to be really convicted of our sinful ways and to submit fully to the authority and to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We ask it in your name. Amen.